Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. As should be fairly apparent at this point, this is a communist podcast, and communists stand for the overthrow of capitalism. But what exactly is capitalism? Karl Marx's main contribution, arguably, is explaining exactly what capitalism is, how it functions as an economic and social system, but it's poorly understood, not just in the bourgeois press, not just amongst clueless liberals, but even amongst some layers of the so-called left. So today we're going to give the devil his name, we're going to define capitalism, discuss capitalism, we're going to thoroughly educate you about what capitalism is, and how we can bring it down, and what we can replace it with. And to help us with that task, we have Nicholas Albin Svensson, who you'll remember from the International Marxist Radio, speaking about Stalin, and he's a member of the International Secretariat of the International Marxist Tendency. Nicholas, it's great to have you back. Thank you very much. So, let's start with the absolute basics. I was having a conversation with my dad a couple of years ago, and he said to me, the thing is, Joe, capitalism is just an expression of human nature. It's always existed. You've always had trade, always had exchange, always had some sort of reward for services rendered. You can't get rid of it because it's just how humans are. Um, but is it true? Is that what capitalism is? Is it just exchanging stuff and getting reward for it? Well, that, that's not what capitalism is. And... Um... It is true that human beings have always uh, traded and uh, interacted with each other for an, previously on a much more limited scale. But that's not what uh, distinguishes capitalism. The bourgeois, they like to present it as being just like, or capitalism is just exchanging one thing for another. Uh, but it's much, much more than that. And really in capitalism, in the, uh, has only existed for... Uh, it depends on how you how you count, but uh, the last few hundred years, uh, properly in uh, Europe and in other parts of the world, even less than that. So, what does define it then? If it's not just exchanging things, what makes capitalism distinct from any other way of running an economy or a society? Well, uh, well, you mentioned Karl Marx, uh, which is an obvious starting point for anyone who wants to analyze capitalism, because really before Marx. Capitalism already existed, but no one really understood what it was. Uh, there were there are economists like uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo who started to come to grips with, started to think about what is this economic system that they're living in, how does it work, and so on. Um, but uh, it was really only Marx who was able to use those uh, the ideas that they've come up with, the analysis that they've uh, of ca of capitalism, and then he took it uh, one step further and actually uh, to fully understand what it really meant. And the key to that was wage labor, mm. which is both uh, Adam Smith and Ricardo had analyzed the importance of wa wage labor in capitalism. So Marx wasn't new in that sense, but Marx took it to the next level to really understand uh, how it took place and how profits were made, and, and all these things. Well, let's start with wage labour then. So what do we mean by wage labour from a Marxist point of view? Well, well, the difference is, so labour or um, work has always existed. Right, you've, as had, as you've, as had, you've had slavery for hundreds of years prior to capitalism. Or even, like, you know, with hunting, gathering things. It's all labour, basically. Mm. Going around, you take your body and you apply it to different tasks in order to achieve... Uh, gather food or uh, produce something, tools or whatever. Produce a podcast episode. Or produce a podcast episode, yeah. Um, but the difference with capitalism is that uh, it's the way labor is organized through wage labor, mm. which means that you are uh, getting a wage for your work. You go to uh, to a company or your uh, boss and you say, hey, I, uh, I, I want a job. And they'll say, well, we'll pay you so much for working uh so many hours, right? And this is the uh, new thing uh, for capitalism. This is not the same as previous society slavery, for example, where famously you did not get a wage at all of uh, feudalism. We had the serfs who initially paid in kind uh, and later on they paid in uh, mo monetary things, but they had a fixed sum of produce that they contributed to their lord. But the difference, the new thing with wage labor is you got a market for wage labor where workers compete against each other and they're trying to basically, and they get uh, given a wage for the wage 
time that they work, basically. It's not to do with the products that they produce, but it's the amount of time that they work. And that's how exploitation takes place in the capitalism, which is different to um, uh, previous societies. Right, because even under feudalism, the peasant will produce a certain amount of vegetables and, and meats and eggs and what have you, take them to the market and sell them for a small profit and use that to pay for whatever he needs in order to survive. But he's not been contracted by the lord of the land to work the land for eight hours or something. And there's a fixed hourly wage that comes with doing that. No, no, precisely. So he would have that. Well, there's a few different ways that in the feudalism a peasant would pay. There was you would pay in kind, as in you produce so much food, and then you give a share of that to your lord, or you work on his land a certain number of hours for free, mm -hmm. um, in return for being able to grow on what was his la on the lord's land. Or later on, you instead of paying in kind, you paid uh, a certain like a kind of tax then to the, the lord. Instead of paying in goods, you paid in monetary things, and you paid a rent uh, to the lord effectively for for the use of the land that was owned by the lord. But on the wage labor, it's not like that because actually the the worker never sees the product. He never gets to sell the product that he produces or or she. Mm. Um, but rather, they they just go to the work. They do what they're told for. X number of hours under the conditions or whatever that had been agreed. And then uh, at the end of the work day, or, uh, the, the boss takes control of the production, what has been produced and sells it on the market. So there's a difference there. And, and all you get as a worker is the wage that, uh, that had been agreed upon under what you might also add, not particularly to the work of favorable circumstances. Mm. Can we define capital? Because... I think that to a lot of people, capital just means money. But Marx is quite specific when he talks about capital. And there's a definition that I was hoping you could expand upon for our listeners. It's quite vivid, where Marx says that capital is dead labor, which vampire-like lives only by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. So what does Marx mean by that? And what actually is capital? Well, capital is... When we talk about this, we talk not about money. Marx sometimes talk about uh, money capital as well, which is money. But uh, the, when we talk about capital in this sense, we talk about machinery, uh, tools, etc. And in a very simple way, uh, if, if you want to uh, hammer in a nail, you're going to need uh, a tool of some sort, a hammer. Uh, mm. uh, knocking it with your hand is going to be extremely difficult and painful. And painful. <laughs> uh, you could do it with a stone. But it's, again, not a very useful tool. A hammer is much better. So in order to become a good carpenter, you're going to start by needing a hammer. And the hammer is your capital, uh, effectively. It's, uh, it's so you, what you need to do, you need to produce the hammer, put, la put labor to work in order to produce the bit of capital, the tool, or the machinery, which is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. But once you've done that, you can't really exploit the hammer. On the hammer on its own, the machine on its own without the worker is just completely dead and you can't exploit it. And I think that's what Marx is getting at. Exploitation comes through, um, in arises in production through uh, the worker selling his uh, labor time. But then the goods that he produces whilst working for the capitalist, working for the company, the goods, the amount of the, the goods that he, the worker produces whilst working is worth more than what he gets paid in his wages. So that's where exploitation comes. It does not come from a clever use of machinery and so on, which is what the bourgeois often likes to present. And that's that's what Marx is saying when he says, oh, it's dead. Basically, you cannot, you cannot exploit uh, capital. You need the worker, only the worker, only living labor, mm. only workers uh, can actually add value to a product. Only, them can, uh, only workers can create value uh, that can then be uh, exploited and um, or where you can create the surplus value where you can get your profits and so on it cannot be happened from just uh, the machinery or the capital on its own right so this is if you like the, the formula of profit production under capitalism the worker is contracted offers to work for a certain amount of time for a certain amount of money and the amount of value they add to the commodities that they work on that become new commodities, the capitalist extracts from that difference their surplus value within which is profit. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so if I hire you to work for eight hours, ten pound an hour, uh, so you get your eighty pounds worth of wages, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, in that time you will be able to produce something maybe worth a hundred pounds or hundred and twenty pounds, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if we disregard the fact about uh, the cost of capital and raw materials, etc., that's my twenty uh, pound or forty pound profits that I made in the uh, in, in the meantime. Now, it is important if I did not make that profit. I would be a terrible capitalist and would very quickly go bankrupt. So it's, in, it's absolutely essential for the capitalist that they make that profit. They can, so any t- kind of, you know, you couldn't be a capitalist without making that profit. A company cannot make any profit, will not be able to satisfy shareholders, uh, will not be able to pay for any of its thing if it cannot do, carry out that simple transaction of getting the worker to work, uh, produce more uh, value than the total amount of his wages. Otherwise, you, it, you just go bankrupt very, very quickly. And so that this is the heart of, of capitalism yeah. and how uh, exploitation functions under capitalism. So at the risk of cutting up my party card and to play devil's advocates, what exactly is wrong with this? Uh, what's the problem here from our point of view? A worker agrees with the capitalist to work for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of money, and the capitalist... Uh, invests in the tools and machinery they use and they sell the commodities that are produced as a result on the market to make a profit and employ more workers and the worker goes on to use that wage to pay for their means of life their rent um, sending their kids to school paying to fill their car with petrol so on and so forth what is our problem as communists with this arrangement well, in a certain sense, if that arrangement was just to like, yeah, okay, this great, capitalists take the money, they invest it, uh, and then, you know, to produce labor becomes more and more efficient, we produce more and more commodities, you know, there's more and more wealth to go around and so on. And every, in that very simple sense, everything seems to be very uh, hunky-dory, like mm-hmm. capitalism would be, uh, you know, uh, an event, ever-growing, you know, expanding wealth and this is the dream of the liberals basically yeah, the the rising tide that lifts all the ships uh, yeah yeah and then you know everyone will benefit because in some way will trickle down and so on and uh, 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 everyone develops all the countries develop and the whole world will be lifted up by this system but obviously we can see today in particular but it, over the past uh, hundred years how this is not the case how time and time again capitalism breaks down into most barbaric uh, crisis and we can see that today with the wars uh, uh, the instability but also the lack of investment the capitalists just aren't investing because uh, and that's a separate thing but they just simply cannot uh, sell the products that they uh, can produce so the factories can produce a lot more products than the market can absorb right so there's not enough um, workers do not have enough money to buy back all the products that they produce. Which Why is, is that exactly? Why is it that eventually the market becomes saturated? Well, that, that's the thing about the situation, right? So you take uh, you take your profits out of uh, the unpaid labor of the working class. This uh, we talked about the surplus value. Uh, you take the profits out of that, but the, so that me- that means that the workers cannot do not have the the means to buy back all the products that they produce. And therefore, okay, sure, as long as the capitalists are investing, this kind of get put back into the economy and so on, and it functions for a while. But at a certain point, this uh, runs into the op- obstacle of that, yes, you invest, but then when you invest, you just create more and more uh, commodities that need to be uh, brought up by the workers, and you can increase the rate of exploitation and so on. So it makes actually, it eventually reaches this point where the factory produced all these factories that cannot that uh, also because it's done in an anarchic way, each capitalist is fighting against each other, making more and more inve- investments. And so the workers would not, uh, they produce all these massive factories with massive overcapacity that can't, and the market um, is saturated with these goods and the factories will be, um, will run at only partial capacity and start losing money. So you've talked about the relationship between wage labor and capital, the way that surplus value is produced by workers and profits are extracted from that. But what exactly do we mean by value and how is it distinct from the price that something fetches on the market? 
Well, Marksman distinguishes between use value and exchange value. And uh, use value is what you can do with something. So the use value of a hammer is that you can hammer nails with it. But the exchange value is uh, basically the amount of labor that is contained in the product. How much long time it takes to produce a product. And then we're talking about that. We're obviously not talking about like, oh yeah, um, we have to consider all the factors that come into that. So the, the question of how long it takes to, if you're a carpenter, you have to cover the cost of your hammer. You have to co- cover the cost of your wood, your nails, etc. So all the accumulated time for every, all the little different components that make up the final element. So, uh, or a car is even more so. So the, the complexity is tremendous of all the different components will all have to be covered by the final price which is otherwise the company will lose money and the this is what the exchange value more or less the price and exchange value is not exactly the same because the price can go up and down a lot and so on exchange value is more but the it is a uh, the price reflects the exchange value Mm. i want to touch on this question you raised of complexity again because the existence of the world market and the social nature of production under capitalism, where you have lots of workers doing different bits of the production process and collaborating on commodities, um, that seems to be a fairly distinct feature of capitalism. I mean, technically, you could go to slave societies where you had lots of slaves building pyramids and temples and what have you, but with capitalism, it seems that a distinct feature is the level of specialization and division of labor that's all concentrated on the production of more complex commodities. And it's funny the extent to which things that seem fairly simple are actually quite difficult to make if you were to attempt it individually. I watched an interesting YouTube doc- documentary about a guy who set the task of making a sandwich but absolutely from scratch, meaning that he had to rear animals for the meat, he had to grind up the wheat into flour, he had to grow the lettuces that he used for the salad, he had to make the mayonnaise out of eggs that he reared from chickens. It took him about six months to produce a single sandwich. And yet, if you go to any shop in certainly an advanced capitalist country, there are shells full of sandwiches produced at a huge rate. Um, And that seems to be something that capitalism is able to facilitate the kind of mass production of those relatively complex commodities based on the socialization of production. So in reality, capitalism, because it developed uh, machinery, tools, machinery, all these things which Marx refers to as the means of production, or Marxist refers to means of production, all these things, it means that we can uh, specialize product, uh, our work in a way, and divide up our work and our tasks in a way that makes it so much more efficient. Mm. Another example that I've heard people say is about the um, uh, ballpoint pen. Right. Yeah, and this was an invention for the uh, Air Force during the Second World War, and it was extremely expensive and real luxury good when it first was developed. And now they could, they churned out like nothing. They cost, uh, I don't know what they cost, like 10 pence or something. But at that point, it was like a really, really expensive luxury good. Because of the application of technology or machinery onto the production of these pens, it just becomes uh, like nothing. You drop a pen, you don't really, you don't really notice it. You don't miss it that wrong. much. No. Uh, you go get a new one for a very small sum of money. So th- this, this um, tremendous development of machinery and technology has enabled us to produce things on a and a much more, also much more social, social not in the sense of going to a party social, but mm. in a socialized way, which this guy is in, interlinks us all, right? So a worker in in Britain who is producing a car is linked by so many threads to a worker in China or a miner in Australia who is uh, producing all the different components that make up this final product of the car. Mm. Because of all the uh, interlinked uh, supply chains and all these questions. So that's so production is completely socialized. It's all done by so many thousands of workers together in order to produce this one final product. And I think that's one of the, you know, one of the... So Marx describes this as being... Uh, uh, production is socialized, but but it's uh, under private control, right? The private ownership of this pro- process. So we got like 
socialistic social socialized production mm. but it's still in private hands right mm. so it's still the capitalists the shareholders are still controlling this production even though it's socialized and carried out in a social manner b- between so many different workers in so many different countries well can i just ask because it seems like a real contradiction doesn't it that everybody has a stake in this system everyone's involved in some way and we're capable of producing so many things that would have sent, feel, felt like witchcraft only a few hundred years ago. We can produce at such a rate. Technology is so sophisticated and advanced. Why is it that we still have a relative shortage for so many people, it seems, of quite basic things like food, like housing, like hospitals, like basic infrastructure, even in the advanced capitalist countries? Why is it that we can achieve so much and yet we can't seem to get the basics right well because capitalism capitalism doesn't produce things because you have needs mm. right it's i mean it's kind of a secondary thing right sure someone wouldn't go out and buy something unless they had some kind of need real or imagined maybe but um uh you know you wouldn't go and buy yourself a sandwich unless you actually wanted to eat it right mm. um so there is um uh there has to be a relationship of course with uh, the use value so to speak uh, there has to be a relation between use value and actually the products. So you, you can't just produce any anything that's completely useless. But the point is that you don't produce in order to satisfy needs. You don't produce sandwiches to feed uh, the hunger of the world. You produce sandwiches because you want to make money. Mm. You want to make a profit. And if you can't make a profit, you won't produce it. And if you are not making a profit, so if you don't, for those uh for poor people who don't have enough money, they're not, not a market for the capitalists. The capitalists want to produce things for, uh, sell things to those who have money who can buy it. So there's no incentive for them or there's no reason, uh, and there's every reason for them not to try to produce uh, food for uh, those who are going hungry because they don't have the money to buy the food. Mm. And that's the real, like, you know, the contradiction of capitalism. And it concentrates, and Marx also drew this, made this point that the whole development of capitalism shows it has a tendency to massively concentrate wealth at the one end of society whilst impoverishing uh, the mass. Uh, we're seeing that very clearly now. We can see it in all the statistics of the last, since the 1980s, how there's been massive increase in inequality, massive concentration of wealth at one end of society, and the massive uh, impoverishment at the other end of society. Mm. Well, it sounds like you're alluding to the creation of monopolies. This is a point that Marx made. It's also a point that Lenin developed in relation to imperialism, which we can talk about later. But what exactly does monopolization or the development of monopoly mean, and why does it happen? Well, the free company, like capitalism in its early stages, consisted of many different producers. In the really, if you go back to the 14th century, in the really early stages of capitalism, it would all be individual producers, uh, where they had very limited technology, very limited tools, and so on. Uh, and production wouldn't have been very socialist at all, socialized at all. Uh, it'd be individual craftsmen and so on competing against each other on the market. And you'd have a very free competition. Even in the 19th century, in the early stages, you would have many different textile mills in, in Britain who was the leader of in production of uh, woolen and cotton textiles. And it had lots of different mills and they were all be competing against each other. But those who are able to, uh, who for one reason or another were doing better, they would make more profits and they would then use that profits in order to invest in more machinery. And because they invested in more machinery, they were able to outcompete their competitors who were using less machinery and therefore their production was more expensive. And they could also buy up their competitors who were going bust or who were struggling or whatever. And they buy up them and use their machinery, their workers, maybe to make the production even more efficient. Um, and so, and this has been, you can see this constantly as a process. And the, the biggest, and the more complex the industries, the more often the more monopolized it becomes. So if you look at now aerospace, for example, you have two manufacturers of commercial aircraft, like you know passenger aircraft, uh, you know the ones you use if you travel, um, uh, and this Airbus and it's Boeing. It's not only two, and out of those two, 
They ma- both have to have quite large state subsidies, both of them. And Boeing is in real trouble with one of its uh, with some of its latest aircraft as well, which means Airbus is now like becoming really dominant to almost have only one company that produces airplane airplanes. So it's really uh, you can see this uh, massive in- investment in technology creates these uh, also these massive monopolies. Again, another sign of like the. Um, we say how capitalism is rotten ripe. Mm. <laughs> it, it's, it's reached this level of where, yes, you have so, socialized production to the extent where you, it's almost only one company that operates. You can feel it in other industries as well. I think there's like six train, uh, you know, not train manufacturers in the world. So the brands that produce rolling stock, uh, to go on railways. You have, um, a handful of companies producing microchips uh, and so on. It's a very, very monopolized uh, market. Um, and uh, yeah, this has been a tendency throughout capitalism, but it's reached really extreme proportions uh, during the last uh, decade or so. So Lenin, as I mentioned, talks about the monopoly stage of capitalism and how this is connected to imperialism, to the forcible grabbing of territory and markets um, by the most powerful capitalist nations internationally. So why is it there's this relationship between the concentration of capital into fewer and fewer hands and the tendency for the most powerful capitalist countries to seize the resources, um, wealth and territory of other countries, other markets. We were talking about like how there was a monopoly on the global market, but before you get to the global market, you have the national market. So you monopolize your own national market. And that's the uh, that's what happened in the 19th century. Towards the end of the 19th century, the, the British wool, cotton, uh, some other industries as well. But they, they reached the point, chemical, electrics, but not so much chemical industries in Britain but nonetheless they reached a level where they had uh, there was like maybe two three companies left in Britain so they monopolized the market the market wasn't growing they, they, they can try to fight it out with the other couple of monopolies but in the end there wasn't really a viable route anymore but they had this built up these productive forces and these factories that could just produce all these goods so they needed to uh, get some uh, go do something with these goods and they started then going abroad. So uh, you have the destruction of the uh, the textile industry in India, for example, because Britain was, well, to some extent, they were going and smashing up the looms and so on. But in general, the most important factor was the fact that the British uh, cotton industries can produce these fabrics at uh, a, a fraction of the price of what you could do with uh, traditional uh, means. So they were destroying the production of all alternative uh, production around the world. This was, I must say, even then, it was not exactly imperialism in the sense that Lenin talks about it. This was still in the age of uh, free uh, competition. But then what happens, obviously, is that these monopolies, they start, they reach a point where it's just not worth it for them to reinvest uh, uh, this money into more uh, machinery, more uh, looms, and so on, because they can already sati- they already got enough productive capacity. It can satisfy the market. Sure, they'll maintain it and whatever, but they're not. They're not really. They're not going to make mass of all these massive profits that they're gathering because they are monopolies. Because they have completely dominated the world market, so they can set the price a little bit like they want. Not completely, but they have some leeway, and they they so then they take these profits and they need to invest it. So they might use it then to build factories abroad. That's a way you can see uh, to get a little bit closer to maybe where the uh, market is. They might also take the money and put it in the banks, right? And the banks then will lend it to another capitalist to, be, to uh, build a factory abroad, and they might lend it to another country. And the banks then become the, often the conduit for all this surplus capital. There's a, so Marx talks about the rise of finance capital being a product of monopoly. So you have all these companies that produce too much, so much uh, profits, they don't know what to do with it. So they put it in the banks and the, in one way or another, and the banks then uh, manage this money uh, and become the conduit of that to other industries to, uh, to invest in other industries. And that's the beginning of 
uh, imperialism uh, and the need then to dominate, to wield off certain markets so that, you know, the, when the German industries are rising, the British don't want the Germans to interfere to compete with them because the Germans are more efficient. They've got mm. more modern machinery and so on. So the British are trying to then to ward off their industries from the German ones. So they have uh, something called imperial preference, whereby the colonies will only... It will at first accept goods from other parts of the empire before they accept goods from outside of the empire. Uh, and this kind of thing, you have to protect what you call protectionism effectively. Mm. Um, and all this is uh, then fueling then tensions, obviously, between Britain and Germany because they're fighting over these colonies because Germany wants to take their goods. The German industries have monopolized the markets. They can't really... Uh, sell any more goods in their own market so they need to go and export the goods and they're hitting up this barrier of the British monopoly of uh, uh, the world basically in the British Empire uh, which was at its highest extent then and this leads them, yeah, this is the background then to World War One. it wasn't just Germany, it was a number of others but this is the and what Lenin identified in imperialism Mm. What would you say? We just watched Miele launching a spittle-flecked rant at the World Economic Forum. Uh, this extreme uh, ultra-liberal who says that the number one problem is that the state gets in the way with the functioning of the market. What do you say to these sorts of libertarian types who think that if the state's just got out of the way of the capitalists and let business be business, then the invisible hand would deal with all of society's ills and give everybody what they need? Well, that was very much the philosophy of the bourgeois, the sort of idea which they called it neoliberalism. But uh, yeah, it was the sort of idea that came out of the 80s, right? To reduce the size of the state, it will solve our problems, the market will function. Yeah, so, Reagan, Thatcher, etc. Yeah. And then in 2008, that came crashing down uh, like a, de- like the house of cards they was. Um, at the moment, the banks obviously would be the biggest proponents of this kind of theories before. Now suddenly they're faced with bankruptcies uh, and uh, they just ran to the state cap in hand and ask for trillions of dollars in bailouts um, in order for the states to prop up uh, the economy. And it's uh, and more monopolized and the more complex and uh, developed the economy becomes, the more important becomes the state becomes as well. Um, in the 1930s, this was less, I mean, the state was still important, but it wasn't as important. They let one, f- because, so they, at that time, they let about one third so after Wall Street crash, let about one third of all banks in the United States go bankrupt, mm. right? Here, there was the Lehman Brothers and that's it. And then you had a couple of smaller ones now. But it's it's a completely different. The state is completely enmeshed in anything. It's like one third of the economy of one third to one to 40% of the economy in most advanced capitalist countries consists of the state. It's completely enmeshed in the economy. And the only thing that's keeping the economy afloat in the United States is a massive budget deficit that the uh, state is running, right? Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I saw Elon Musk praising Millet's speech at Davos, saying, oh, well, he's really sticking it to these elites. Of course, Tesla, his company, would not have survived its first year, second year. It wouldn't still be around were it not for huge amounts of support from the US states, huge amounts of federal investments um, and protectionist measures that kept it afloat. Like Tesla wasn't profitable for, I think, something like the first 10 years of its existence. Yeah, or, or like, uh, you know, Amazon, when they were like, relocating their headquarters somewhere, there was this bidding war where all these different uh, US states were saying, oh, yeah, if you come here, we'll give you this money or we'll give you this land for free or you get these tax breaks for however many decades, right? Mm. This is the way it works. You know, the big corporations, they get... Well, there's the um, TSMC who's getting massive subsidies to produce this uh, this um, uh, plant in Arizona. Uh, there's, uh, I think it's Intel who's getting billions of dollars to, to or euros, I guess, to build a factory in uh, Germany. Mm. This is part of how capitalism works. It's how, part, particularly in the age of monopoly and imperialism. So Mille, he's got it completely... Uh, he well, I say he's he's like a utopian mm. in in the way that he uh, he think he it's it's bears very little reality how the world really works, and I think he'll have a rude shock as well. 
I mean, to some extent, I think he's just talking, uh, and it's just his rhetoric, and he's a demagogue, and he, this is his rhetoric rather than being actual uh, something he actually. But he is taking steps in that direction already. He's trying to reduce, cut the size of the state and so on. But it really is partly also just a reflection of what the bourgeois need doing because of the deep crisis that Argentina is in. They need to massively attack the working class. And obviously that also sees, you know, you see the other side of the state and you see the working class mobilizing against Millet. There's a general strike being called. And what is the first thing that happens? The police send out the police to beat up um, or harass or... Uh, attack the use the law and the state in order to try to uh, attack the workers uh, and try to push them back, disrupt the strikes and so on. And this is obviously the, another side of how the capitalists always use the state. It's like this thing of like uh, just defend private property, defend uh, and trying to push the working class back. Yeah. So all this inequality you have under capitalism, how do you maintain it? Well, you gotta have something to keep it alive, and the state is precisely that. You use violence violence uh, in order to enforce this state of inequality, enforce this massive uh, disparity between the uh, rich and the poor. So just to draw this together into a final comment, I know that some would argue, I know that obviously the defenders of capitalism would argue, but the liberals and reformists as well, those who might make left noises but ultimately don't want to break with the system, they would say, well, okay, it's not great, imperialism isn't great, exploitation is not fantastic, but it's all worth it in the end because, you know, commodities get to shelves, uh, the capitalists are incentivized to invest, at least to a certain extent, the march of technology carries on, and aren't things better than they were a hundred years ago? 200 years ago isn't capitalism at the end of the day as good as we're going to get um and how could it possibly be better marx says that capitalism came to being dripping blood from every pore and the way that uh, uh the the early stage of capitalism when it was uh um looting the whole of latin america's mm. Uh, the tremendous human suffering that brought then the slavery to the Caribbean. You have and the slavery that continued in the United States and so on. Capitalism has an absolutely brutal history. Um, even countries like uh, Sweden, which is has been renowned in subsequent years, and I'm from Sweden, has been renowned for being like you know uh, sort of workers' paradise. Although that was never true, but. Um, but in the late 19th century, it was absolutely devastating for uh, for the poor in Sweden when they created the Swedish working class. Uh, and so the, uh, in the space of about 20 years, 900,000 people left Sweden, mainly young people. Um, and the population at that time was uh, 5 million. A little bit earlier, you had a similar thing happening in Ireland. Uh, where um, uh, with the tremendous famines and so on, which forced huge amount of people to leave the island and then to, to fill up, uh, go to the United States, or more importantly to Britain, to become workers in Britain and uh, be a labor force for British industries. And that kind of brutal way in which capitalism operates, you can see it still today. If these waves of refugees, people deprived of their livelihoods, uh, through wars or economic factors and so on, and being driven to the West, where they then have to fill in some, uh, be p pick berries or work in uh, uh, low wage jobs and so on, mm. uh, in order to fill the needs of a capitalist economy. So this is, so in that so that sense, capitalism is absolutely brutal and devastates uh, thing to so many people all the time. But obviously what it has done on the other hand as well is to create, you know, it has developed the productive forces precisely um, as we've described. And it created the ability for us and technology to create to this extent where we have it today, which means that we are able to, uh, what must be seem quite miraculous to people even 100 years ago with computers, with airplanes, with uh, cars and all the space, cra space travel and so on. But all of that, there's, if you say that, if, if you say that there was a kind of period of capitalism's history where it could play a progressive role, where it could develop the 
means of production, could develop technology and so on. But today you can see that that's, that period is finished. You see, there's no investment anymore. The uh, it's just leaping, going leaping from one crisis to another. Mm. Uh, be it environmental crisis, economic crisis, you even had the pandemic, and it just it's like um, it's like an old uh, uh, old person just going from uh, one illness to another. And obviously, the, the whole problem is that the system has outlived its usefulness. It mm. can't function anymore. It cannot maintain itself it's developed the productive forces to this extent and now it cannot take humanity forward so what do we need to take humanity forward if you say we can look at it a really broad historical point of view in a sense we've had class society not just capitalism there was other class societies we mentioned like slavery feudalism and so on and class society most of human um, existence we didn't have classes i mean Maybe for the last 10,000 years or so, we've had classes or stratification uh, with castes and so on. Um, uh, Egyptians was one of the early ones uh, uh, of these societies, but really took off with slavery uh, in Greece and Rome. But uh, these kind of societies have only existed for the last 10,000 years, and Homo sapiens have existed for 300,000. So for most of human society, we didn't have uh, classes. We're class, living in a state of classless society, and the um, the last of the last ten thousand years, we've managed to develop our technology and our control of nature to a, an well, obviously unprecedented level, and this enabled us now to return to the state of classlessness, but on a higher level. And that's really what uh, what the conclusion that Marx drew. Um, back in the 19th century, that capitalism precisely prepared the way for a higher, uh, for return to uh, communism. He talked mm. about primitive communism of being the early pre-class society. And then he says, well, now you have the higher level of communism, which we could, uh, so we can return to communism, but on a higher level. So on a level of sophistication and uh, technological, cultural, economic development that we have, uh, that uh, you could only dream of a hundred years ago, really. Or and this is so. But what is necessary, precisely? We've kept referring to this point, like you know, we have socialized production, but it's in private hands. So what is needed for this to happen is that the means of production, the factories, the land, and and so on, they need to be uh, put also socialized. They should not be not be in private hands, but need to be uh, turned into collective ownership. Right. So. Mm that all, all these tremendous resources can be taken into common ownership and used and planned for the needs of everyone, not to make profits or f for individual capitalists to enrich the already rich, the bil make the billionaires even uh, richer, but to actually to provide uh, a decent living for everyone and then all, uh, eventually also, um, you know, uh, liberate us from the drudgery of, of work, um, in, in all forms. Mm. And that's precisely the future the communists are fighting for. But as we've said a number of times on this show, if you want to change the world, if you want to place all of the accomplishments of human civilization into the hands of the majority, wresting them from the hands of the parasitic minority, then you can't do it alone. You have to be organized. So if you haven't already and you've enjoyed what you've had to say, you agree with our analysis, then Get in touch with the IMT, join the communists and help us to fight for precisely the end of capitalism and the dawn of a new era for humanity where we'll go from the, as Marx and Engels put it, animal struggle for survival to a genuinely human existence. Nicholas, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'll see you all next week.